Welcome uh, everyone uh, to our uh, second panel conversation uh, that um, we are doing as part of our Sleep Out for Homelessness uh, campaign for 2022. And um, we, we're doing these panel conversations, I guess, in, in a way to, to help us uh, as a group understand uh, the broad sort of um, uh, context and issues around homelessness and, and you know homelessness is is many things and it, it's you know we shouldn't sort of imagine it as one thing and what was interesting last week in the conversation was um, you know we were looking at it from the context of people working within the sector um, who deal with you know trauma and people going through homelessness on a day-to-day -day basis but what I was interested in um, in the second panel conversation is to bring it back to something we're all familiar with, which is design. And uh, to that end, uh, we have uh, probably, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> two of the, the, uh, the, the best people to, to talk uh, about in, in, uh, in Australia, I think. But um, the first uh, uh, panellist today um, who will lead off our conversation is Sophie Diary. Now, uh, Sophie... Um, is a is a passionate um, uh, advocate for um, all all things housing and, and social housing, and you know she's uh, her practice called projects is uh, interested in uh, well specialist in in uh, landscape and uh, architecture. Uh, bothly, uh, she uh, has done a lot of uh, quite interesting projects in the social and affordable housing uh, scheme. Um, uh, areas and you can see some of those and, and I'm in particular interested in a lot of the work that you've done with Vic Roads and um, the, but the thing that we're talking about uh, uh, today specifically is is the design guide uh, that you worked uh, alongside the uh, Lord Mayor's uh, I think it was a charitable trust or foundation uh, Monash University um, uh, your own practice in XLX uh, studios uh, in Victoria um, following uh, Sophie's presentation, um, Leah Lang um, will uh, present um, and talk a little bit about uh, her role as now state government um, architect and what the Queensland state government are doing to improve the lot of the design of social housing and neighbourhoods um, uh, in uh, Queensland. Um, Leah has had uh, a long career in, in both academia and uh, the profession. Um, went through uh, the, uh, the struggles of uh, Gold Coast uh, architects. Um, helped write a lot of the program for the foundation uh, course at uh, Bond University. Um, and you know the the thing is, is and currently in the role of uh, Queensland State Government architect and. The, the thing without sort of trying to embarrass anyone too much that, you know, you can read all of the, the bio information about people and, and sort of get interested about, you know, what it is that they've achieved. But frankly, I think Leah's biggest asset is being Leah because she can, she can listen to people, you know, bring people on board together and come to consensus and everyone leaves happy and everything's better for it. So I think uh, that, that it's your gift that uh, that is, is your real buyer. So, and then last but not least is uh, is Kelly, who's who's going to thankfully fill the air after I start up, shut up talking. Um, and and Kelly is 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 a, a brilliant uh, colleague, ex-colleague, I guess, because I'm not there full time anymore. But um, you know, Kelly has been working um, in this uh, field of, uh, I guess, understanding, um, you know, how design and, um, you know, the way that people live, um, very interested in issues of equity um, and making sure that everyone, you know, has uh, the best opportunities in the way they live and the way that they continue uh, conduct their lives. So I think that's a, it's a real asset to have three very talented people uh, on this conversation. So look, um, I'll stop talking. Thank you very much uh, for the three of you to be part of this. And Sophie, I'll hand over to you to um, take charge of the screen. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Michael, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, OK. 
okay. It was interesting you said housing first um, at the beginning because um, I thought I would sort of focus um, attention around this idea of housing first and it's something that um, I strongly believe in and um, my team strongly believes in if we can provide a safe, secure and affordable home to people, then um, everyone can then from that position start dealing with anything else that they might need to deal with in their lives or address in their lives, such as education, health, employment. Um, so I thought if I start off with this slide, it'll, it'll be there um, in everyone's mind as I go through. Um, and I also wanted to put up um, in one of the first slides too, is the people that we work for. So um, as Michael said, um, my practice scored uh, our architects and landscape architects, and we predominantly work with housing associations and the not-for-profit sector down here, including the state government, delivering social and affordable housing. But they're, the, they're the, the clients that I immediately deal with, but it's all about the people that move into the homes that we design. So um, just some photos here of some people that have um, been fortunate enough, given the wait lists that we have around the nation, to um, secure one of the properties that we've um, designed. And I can tell you the best bit about my job is um, when I get to visit these occasionally and speak to the residents and the impact that a house has made um, to them, one that they can afford and one that they feel safe and secure in. So I am first and foremost a practitioner, but uh, as Michael also said, I'm um, passionate about affordable and social housing. So I do supplement practice with um, uh, looking for opportunities to speak on the subject and write on the subject um, and co-convene um, symposiums, exhibitions, really any opportunity that I can get, I will, I will take to um, spread the word. Um, first, I'll run through a couple of our built works and then I'll get to the design guide. Um, this is a project that we finished in 2016 with a group down here in Melbourne called Women's Property Initiatives and they provide social housing to women headed households. Um, these are seven townhouses, two two bedrooms, so with a, um, a woman and a child or, or a couple of children and then five one bedrooms for single women. Um, and what I've tried to do in this presentation too is, is not um, put forward all the, um, you know, the publicity shots we have done um, at the end of built work. I've, I've put in as many as I can photos that are taken by residents. I got to speak to a number of residents at this um, development through things we've organised and, and I've also done the post-occupancy research resident, residents here that fed into the design review, uh, the design guide, sorry. Um, and these are photos of how the resident um, had occupied firstly the um, east facing terrace, which is, uh, sorry, east facing courtyard, which is the arrival space um, and how she's really customised and personalised that space. And, on, and then on the right, um, how she's occupied and personalised the west facing terrace that we envisaged was sort of a, a service space. Um, and some diagrams in the middle of how we think about um, how this housing that is speculative because we never know who is actually going to move into our houses at the end, but how flexibility and multiplicity can be accommodated to then um, be suitable to anyone that may move in. Um, a project that Michael mentioned also was one that we finished um, three or four years ago as well. It's the Harris Transportable Housing Project. And these are modular dwellings of about 20 square metres internally, and they have about nine square metres of deck to the front and the rear of the dwelling. And these are fully um, fabricated in a factory environment and they, they the footings are done on site and the services are run to them and they're craned in. Um, and they are transportable. So the land that was given to launch housing was uh, land owned by the Roads Authority down here, Vic Roads, and um, they're on five-year leases. So if Vic Roads does ever need um, the sites back, we will. they will help um, launch housing, find alternative um, land, and these um, guys will be moved off. So there was 57 of these across nine sites um, in Western Melbourne. Um, along Ballarat Road in Footscray and, and Maidstone. 
And again, some photos of um, how one of the residents truly embraced tiny living. Um, a lot of people have referred to this project as, as tiny homes, given the 20 square metre footprint, um, which is over a ground floor and a little mezzanine area. Um, but I was fortunate enough to visit one of the residents and he had really embraced the idea of tiny living and multiplicity and how you could use every inch of space for something. So some photos there of how a drawer can pull out and it becomes his cutting board in the kitchen. Um, when he opens the little um, robe um, that he has this extendable space to hang clothes when he's ironing. Um, even how he's accommodated hanging his bike on the fence in the, the yard around the home itself. Uh, and one organisation that we're very proud to work with and our relationship continues is with Aboriginal Housing Victoria. Down here, we've done a number of um, infill projects with them um, in our, our southeastern suburbs and they're similar arrangements to these two or, two or three townhouses um, on a site. And what was really important here for us um, was to work with the seven design principles that Aboriginal Housing Victoria had established in workshops with their tenants. So it was one of the first times we were able to work with tenants' needs in a sense through these design guides, which had been developed with tenants when we can't actually um, design specifically for tenants. And that's why the, the post-occupancy research we did for the design guide was so important to close that loop and get the feedback on assumptions and design um, objectives that we have, whether they're actually hitting the mark. Um, and one of the front gardens that's been truly um, um, taken on board and beautified um, and made personal to one of the residents. Uh, so earlier this year in March, we um, scored projects um, with Monash University in the XYX lab within Monash University. Um, we were awarded what was a couple of years ago, a grant by the Lord Mayor Charitable Foundation to put together a design guide for older women's housing. Um, you know, the statistics on women facing homelessness in this country is appalling. There's about they estimate 410,000 women over 45 that are homeless or facing homelessness. And that's because of um, systemic issues um, of uh, gender pay gaps, low, uh, lower superannuation, um, care duties, um, to name a few things. Um, and it's a real crisis. Uh, so there's a lot of research out there on the figures um, but there was no research out there on um, what housing should look like for older women. So um, this is what we did um, through our, our grant. We went back and did post-occupancy research on a number of projects that we've been involved in um, and also projects that we hadn't been involved in but had been designed specifically uh, for women. Um, and I just wanted to run through a few of the areas in the guide. Um, we speak about nine um, chapters which really relate to places or spaces and I'll run through a few of them now. Um, I'll leave you to read the quotes. These are actually quotes from women that we um, interviewed. Um, but communal space we found to be highly valued in uh, projects for older women. Uh, the size of that on-site community was sort of critical as well, so up to about 30 felt like a good size to the women that we interviewed. Um, and that communal space, when it had been provided, was really embraced by the community. But the location was critical um, in that it had to be designed in a way that no one adjacent to it would take ownership over it. So that it was designed in a way that it really did felt communal to the whole on-site community. And that was very easy to access. And it needed to be large enough to accommodate different groups and to accommodate furniture. Um, for them in that space. Their private outdoor spaces were also um, highly valued. Um, I think one of the things that um, doesn't get uh, grabbed in the conversation so much is pets. Um, uh, it's, it's changing now, but we've been doing social housing for over a decade. And when we started, um, pets were um, 
not not considered at all um and people sometimes like rough sleepers for example having to decide between whether they wanted a home or to stay with their pet which is just um a ridiculous sort of decision to be faced with um but the women we spoke to their outdoor space was very important to them for their pets for their grandkids that um would come over a place to sit in the sun uh you know a place to um, enjoy some downtime so really highly valued and the design of that was um, incredibly important to them. Their entry, so we talked about entry in two respects, if it was say an apartment building or even our tiny homes, that there was dual entry points, there would be the building entry or maybe the front gate and then the entry to, the, to their homes. And this was um, really a highly valued um, area in terms of security. Um, women, so many of them valued the intercom so just a simple um, uh, fixture as an intercom, but that gave them the ability to say yes to people approaching their homes or their spaces and no. And that's and it was not, um, I guess, in their past, something that they may have had that, that ability to control that. So um, entries and spy holes, um, intercoms, cameras were really valued in and, and terms of how that played out in their security. Um, and a little spin-off that I thought I'd mention from the um, design guide research was um, a series of talks and installation that we did at M Pavilion this year called Making Home. Um, because we collected all these beautiful quotes from all these incredible women, um, we put together um, an exhibition of these quotes and, and we were there for um, a week. And yeah, that's my last slide. Thank you. There you Thanks for that, Sophie. Um, uh, I might, did, did, so Kelly, do, do we want to just quickly keep going and then um, I'll let you do a break of the conversation at the end? Yeah, that sounds like a great plan, I think, Michael. Perfect. Okay. Leah, I'll, uh, we'll hand over um, control to you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation, everyone. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks, Sophie. That was that was fantastic. I've spent the last sort of couple of days reading through your um, design guideline, which is excellent. Um, so I'm just going to share screen. Sorry, I'm a bit um, useless with Zoom. I'm so hooked on to um, Teams. It's a bit weird. So just bear with me. Um, is no, is that all right? We're yes. getting the wrong screen. We're getting Are you getting your you Zoom. That's all right. That's it. Sorry, I've got too many things open, which is my usual um, issue. No, I don't want that. Hide. Sorry, everyone, I'm getting there. Oh, God forbid. In government, when you load on programs, they ask you about 4,000 times if that's what you actually want to do. I'm like, yes, I'm pretty sure that's what I want to do. Um, <laughs> excellent. So you can see that now? Oh, no. Yes, I can. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Oh, sorry. hang on. No, no, we've, we've gone back. There no. oh, there I can you see go. it now. Great. Sorry. I... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is what you get on a laptop too. Um, excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. So I'll, um, I'll start with discussing um, the piece of work that the Government Architects Office did when we were in partnership with um, Department of Housing. So we don't sit with Department of Housing anymore, but we did, Public Works did for a very long period of time. And through good relationships, um, a program of works had commenced um, regarding the density done well competition. So I'll start off talking about making good neighbourhoods. Our role is across government is to advocate for better design places across Queensland. Um, we can sit across all departments, even though we sit within energy and public works currently. Um, we find ways to build relationships to start talking about design and early upfront conversations to lower risks of projects and get better outcomes and better value for public expenditure of money. Our macro document and our motherhood endorsed document by the Minister is Q Design. Um, hopefully some of you are familiar with that and the nine principles that sit under that and that's again to provoke a discussion to start being aware of what good design is so that it's not gold plating. It really is a conversation about designing for place and people. So these are the nine principles and they sit under three themes about working with context, establishing a strong structure and then demonstrating leadership. One of the key 
principles is obviously creating a great place for people to live. And we think that's been part of making good homes and a good home is for everybody, um, is very critical under the social housing um, banner that we've been designing homes for. This is a beautiful um, product uh, at Todd's Road Launton by Karen and Co. So in partnership with Communities Housing and Digital Economy, which is now what it's called, we're in the process of delivering 20 social housing demonstration projects that came from the winners of the Density Done Well competition. Out of the Density Done Well competition, we also came up with a guideline that sits under Q Design. So Q Design being the motherhood document, we then strip that down to typology specific outcomes that we're after. And social housing is the first one of those. We're proposing um, heritage, um, as well as potentially a modular housing for government employee housing as well that might come from this. So what we did is really the key principles were about generally about good housing and we think this can be utilised for anybody. Um, we used a lot of case studies as well within the guideline. Um, as Sophie had mentioned, it's really important that we embed that back to the people that will be living in this space and, and how they have learned, and that's through post-occupancy evaluation and just watching how different trends have changed in how people are living and how the service providers are assisting that wraparound care that comes with being in social housing. So the key to it was make a good neighbor, um, be a good neighbor and make a good neighborhood. It was taking a block as sort of, I think it was based on a particular place, but we stripped that back and de-identified it to um, give the premise for the competition to make it have some constraints for people to push and work against. And obviously it was sitting within that missing middle space that we talk about, which is really the idea that we have a lot of single detached dwellings and we tend to do high rise apartments quite well, but there's not a great deal of typology mix provided within the Eastern Seaboard communities in Australia. So we're missing a fair few well-designed duplexes, dual locks or manor homes, terrace houses and townhouses and low rise apartments. And even as we move forward to those more complex sort of um, row housing and multiple dwellings that we can look at um, and mixed use. So we sort of cap it between that two to six stories and, and they're the ones that we think the missing middle can also be that hidden density that neighbourhoods can handle a little bit more and have a little bit less um, reservations about it sitting within their neighbourhood. So the missing middle needs a place to call home. This is another one of the, oh, actually, yeah, this is one of the demonstration projects, the Hawthorne siblings from Refresh Design. So this was two freestanding homes that were on a corner lot, um, a standardised corner lot and the front home was moved forward and they have two free um, hold lots now at the rear of those. Some of the missing middle challenges are, like we mentioned, putting higher densities into existing low density neighbourhoods and the understanding of what that looks and feels like. Often that is a reticence of destruction of landscape and maybe not as much shade trees or, or higher footprints and site covers reducing landscaping and potentially her, um, causing heat sink. And then cars, people are very, very worried about the cars um, being along the streets if there is um, more homes and more density rather than you know, and multiple people living in, in homes, which can actually have, happen mostly in single detached homes as well. Um, the demographics and the information um, shows that people are ageing. So we are having older people in our neighbourhoods and um, the prevalence of single person households is getting higher. So a lot of the older housing stock in Queensland was three bedroom homes. So that's not really fit for purpose. They're three bedroom homes, possibly not built out of the best constructed materials. So they're sitting around about that 40 to 50 year mark now and they're actually have single occupants often sitting in them on quite large lots, sort of 600 to 800 square metre lots. Um, it, it is a very big discussion to, to talk about relocating people. Um, and that's, that's a discussion that the department um, is looking at putting a, a program of works through. So I think you can see here um, the housing supply and demand. You can see the current owned portfolio, as we mentioned, quite high in the three better. Um, and then where we're looking um, into what the additional dwellings we need and the, the really high need is the one and two beds, but predominantly one. And we wouldn't say, I completely agree with Sophie's work. It's not one, we don't look at studio flats or anything like that. It really needs to be a one with a study nook and another space that people can work from home or look at a hobby, um, not putting them into places. There's a lot of research on short term studios are okay, but not, not for long term to um, have those different uses and, and the ability to just segregate parts of your life. 
Um, within the social housing guideline, we came through then and had a series of technical documents and then also a series of templated um, floor plates. And that was to help providers and anyone looking into social housing and designing a social housing project to give them guidance on what these look like. So we run them through the studio to, through to three bedroom and across the general right through to platinum um, quality and accessibility. So what we also need to look at now is a housing choice that responds to our climate. And a lot of the designs previously had not done that. Um, we have higher rainfall, higher heat. Um, these are usually not sites put into flood areas, um, if by choice, but some of them already have existing conditions where now these are floodable sites. So we're looking at resilience builds in those as well. And as we know and mentioned, our neighbourhoods are getting hotter. So when we look at southeast Queensland, we can see actually that some of the more vulnerable um, councils and regional council areas, um, the hotter it gets, the more vulnerable they are. And you can see Toowoomba, Logan, Ipswich and Cairns um, are really, you know, these are quite at risk. And if we do not accommodate the different type of housing to incorporate good shade, good insulation, good orientation, um, and not just replicable housing that may not be suitable to purpose. We've got to look at that as well. So we need more green spaces to cool our neighbourhoods down, which we know. Um, and this is the beautiful Anne Street by Anna O'Gorman Ar 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 Architects. And that's located on the Gold Coast and had principles of Woosard to manage the um, overland flow as the site was quite steep, as well as um, eventually well more, more established landscaping around a communal garden. Uh, this is a front streetscape of that. Um, there are actually street trees since this photo has been taken. A um, little bit of an underground service trench issue <laughs> at the time. Um, but you can see how well this was This was two, three bedroom freestanding fibro homes. Um, so the two lots have been amalgamated and now there are seven bedrooms within this product. Um, this density was accepted by the local council because of the value to the streetscape by decoupling the cars around the side. Um, just here, there was actually less driveway cuts. So we removed one driveway cut and allowed for these beautiful permeable um, little vestibules coming off the streetscape that really give that activation to the street and that lovely human scale. Um, so it's actually improved the streetscape from what it was. And that's been very well received. This is the floor plan of that. So you can see at C, the cars being decoupled, which we talked about. Um, the cars being quite an issue when you start to increase density. This has actually removed the issue and the intensity of even garages to the street. Um, and you can see the different unit layouts. Um, and there is another, there's two units sitting on top of the one adjacent the cars. Um, they each have their own, right down to the detail about where the wheelie bins will sit, a private um, courtyard, as we discussed, and Sophie mentioned the dual access from behind and from the front. Um, there was bike storage, so just beautifully thought of the ability to interact when chosen, but also the ability to sit quietly and have, um, have private space, but still looking out onto that internal courtyard. So we continue to test ideas on these demonstration projects. We've got one being built out of CLT, so we're looking at construction techniques, materiality, um, different configurations and typologies, and working with local councils and the Department of Housing to progress some of these ideas. Um, we also share um, with a network across the um, Government Architects Network with New South Wales and Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia as well to share ideas. Um, and that's really it for me. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Leah um, and Sophie. It was great to hear from you both. Um, <clears throat> I think what we might do now is have about um, 15 minutes of chat between the three of us but if um, any of the audience have got questions for um, Sophie or Leah pop them in the chat and I'll ask them and if you'd like to we might do it parlor style and invite you to jump on with your mic and ask the question um, directly or if not I can ask it um, but what I'd like to start off with this is the common theme of yours which is um, fantastic and I really appreciate that which is that design isn't gold plating um, it's, it's something that's really going to provide value to a building. And having just been on a field trip to um, Mornington Island, um, uh, sorry, so I think somebody's got a weird background noise there. If 
Anyway, I'll keep going. Having just been on a field trip to Mornington Island and looking at some of the social housing up there for an Aboriginal community, I can tell you that the design, you know, the houses are quite aged, some of them, but the design is really poor and that's really resulting in bad outcomes for people who are living in those houses. So um, how difficult, Sophie, maybe we can start with you, is it to get across that message that design isn't um, gold plating but it's got this incredible impact. Perhaps you can tell us about some of the impacts that you've seen that good design can have for residents. Um, thanks, Kelly. I think um, we can do so much that doesn't cost any additional money at all. So you, you get the design principles right, you get the correct orientation right, you get north, um, in our case, north, uh, sunlight into your external internal living spaces as much as possible depending on the size of the development obviously you get the shading right and cross ventilation um, and those passive um, design principles that costs no more to a project and has a massive impact um, particularly to the residents if you get all that stuff right it will reduce their running costs um, and a lot of these people are managing very tight budgets if they're living on some kind of um, government assistance <clears throat> and uh, in addition to that we look for moments of joy that cost um, maybe a little bit extra but not the gold plating either so um, you know in um, the Coburg townhouses you may have seen you know we se selected a yellow yellow suffeet paint colour um, as a moment of joy and we, we do that throughout houses too we'll, we'll always put a pendant light above a dining room table to mark that space um, rather than just down lights throughout. So uh, we do look for little moments of joy, but you can get design principles correct that don't cost you anything and actually have great impact to the people that live there. And is that a hard sell though? Do you, do you, are you finding that people are coming on board with this idea rather than thinking architectural design is, you know, off form concrete, 250 square metre houses, you know, are we getting that message across, do you think, or do we need to do more? Uh, I definitely in my sector we are. Right. <laughs> I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, because I, I don't, I have very little to do with the private housing sector, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what kind of message we're getting out there, but certainly in my sector, the the organisations that develop these um, projects and also have, there's a cost for them too, maintenance or um, common spaces or what have you, they're very aware of um, making the right choices um, up front for, for their organisations, but also for their tenants. So in my sector, yeah, I think, I think we're doing well. The private sector, I'm not so much. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, but that's great to hear. Leah, what's your sort of experience? Because obviously you're pushing design as a solution. How are we going with the idea that it's not only about um, being fancy and flash, but good value for money, climate resilience, social sustainability, those kind of elements? Um, <laughs> some days I think we're winning, other days not so much. <laughs> There's a lot of embedded cultural narrative that is very hard to break in, in government. In Queensland, we had a very particular style that the, the housing looked like, that social housing was meant to meet. And it's only been, I think, the complexity of the way society is moving and the expectations. So we're having kickback from local governments because community didn't want to have that type of housing next to them. It's not the people are a different thing. It's actually the, the style of the architecture or lack thereof architecture that was actually starting to cause problems because they were, all, were almost branded as social housing product. So that has been a bit of an issue where the local governments, even though state can override them in an approval process, that's not seen to be something that they want because that's you know potentially negative attention to the development in itself. Um, and also complexities about resilience, sustainability, carbon neutrality, just these things that we know, as well as a great amount of research that's almost factual about better homes create, as Sophie's saying, better, you know, outcomes. So they make people feel better and safer. And if there are discussions about any transitional housing that people may get out of social housing because they have had these, these good experiences, and that would be one of the best outcomes. But 
yes, I think now the complexity starts to make people feel that design needs to be drawn in in a more serious manner, and as they, because they can't answer it with what they the cookie cutters that they were using beforehand. So, yeah, so it's it's getting there. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm interested too in the change over say the last ten or fifteen years. I mean, social housing to this um, segmentation, if you like, of the market where we're getting um, older women's housing, we're getting housing for single parents. How do you think that this is going to change going forward? So if you think that um, this kind of approach is going to carry on so that we've got more specific and less generic housing? Yeah, possibly. Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, we it's sort of a product of the way it's structured down here, perhaps. I mean, we work with organisations that have specific um, cohorts that they provide housing for. So Women's Property Initiatives does housing for women and children. Aboriginal Housing Victoria does housing for Aboriginal um, people and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, there's also um, organisations here that just provide sort of general social housing mm -hmm. stock, including Homes Victoria for the state government. Um, but I think there is there are opportunities about getting more specific in housing and those more specific outcomes providing a better environment for people. But across the board, there's things that everyone needs, you know, that, that can't be um, skimped on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. great. Le Leah, how do you see that um, difference here in Queensland? What's happening here in that sort of approach? Um, similar to Sophie, I think the housing providers, the community housing providers, have a little bit more scope to do that, to, to pick a segment of the market that they, they do best and be able to manage that, whereas government, as I understand it, I'm still learning, I believe it is first in, first served. Whoever's on the top of the list needs to be catered for first. Um, and I would have to say that um, that can be a little bit problematic when we are looking at doing things like those. Sorry, it's because something feeding back. But um, yeah, into the like communal spaces especially. I think there are very good design principles you can put across a lot. But when you're trying to create a community um, of safety and um, I guess connection, that can be a little problematic if you if you can't kind of curate that to a, a certain extent. Yeah, okay. So it, it's quite complex at the moment how this is all moving forward. And I think it's really interesting. Do you think that um, the fact that more architects and designers seem to be interested in this, we're getting people of, dare I say it, Sophie's quality, like scored projects doing really excellent work that's winning awards. Do you think that that's helping? Or do you think there's a little bit of a worry that um, we shouldn't be doing award winning projects? Um, if I'll just jump in for so yes, we have yeah. had obviously the um, Anne Street project won um, the highest award of multiple housing in the Queensland State Architecture Awards, which was fantastic. And I believe besides a Cox project, I think it's the only the second time an affordable housing project has been listed, a state, social housing state owned project. Um, and we did have some discussions. There was some some rhetoric that we shouldn't be celebrating that, and maybe we don't want to win awards because they deem that that is perceived as if it's not gold plating, it's it's too much emphasis on the design and, and that then everyone will want one, which is just preposterous, I think, um, to showcase that we're doing a good job. We can also find the demonstration projects as with any architectural project, if you do a one-off, the cost does not come back as the most effective way of building, but if we can scale it and do it more and we've learnt lessons after different construction techniques, then obviously they come back better. But for people that would like to grab onto some of these facts as a reason why not to do something better or different, um, there's always, yeah, there's always that argument to be run. Yeah. Sophie, I noticed that one of your design principles was that uh, size matters. And I thought that that was really interesting because we've seen a lot of um, emphasis on smaller homes um, and for, for, say, single older women, but there's obviously, say, in the Aboriginal housing space or for migrant groups or many other parts of our community, including women-headed households, uh, if we're focusing on the kind of um, women and children aspect, there, there's a big demand for larger household sizes too. Is that a harder sell to get up at the moment? 
or is that not so much a focus of some of the organisations? Um, again, the uh, I, we need like we need so many approaches. It's not like a you know one size fits all here. So I'm at all for attacking this from every angle possible. Um, I know that the highest demand here are one and two bedroom um, dwellings, uh, but there's also a demand, like you say, for four and five um, bedroom dwellings for perhaps larger families. Um, I haven't worked on any of those. So I know there is a little demand um, out there. Um, I don't know if that, that demand's being met by, you know, some of the larger existing sort of suburban housing stock. Um, mm. Uh, but I know for new builds, the demand um, on the wait list is for one and two bedrooms. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I think maybe one of the reasons or one of the pressures that we're seeing in social and public housing is that it's so hard to get that the most vulnerable groups are on the list. And so they are often people who might fall more into that one or two bedroom category, like people with severe and persistent mental health uh, challenges or people with severe disabilities and so on. So it's quite a um, it's quite a challenging sector, I think, from that perspective is in that many of the um, future occupants can have a lot of health, physical and mental health challenges. Um, is that something that design is really focusing on and tackling? Um, yeah, so sadly, because we're not producing enough social housing to keep up with demand, it really is like the crisis solution now when we are dealing with people that are, are really facing um, a, a extreme crisis in their housing situation to get um, to the top of the list. Um, uh, we also do, um, outside of general social housing, we've started to do a lot of the SDA, so specialist disability accommodation um, under the NDIA. Uh, and that is a sort of a subcategory of um, social housing, I guess. Um, so we're familiar with dealing with that. Also, I guess as um, extreme's not the right word, but um, I mean, the new national construction codes coming in where we will all have to be achieving, I think, yes. still in the middle of the year anyway. So considering the circulation and, and doors and stuff, which is, um, I think, a positive thing forward because we can start, you know, addressing the idea of ageing in place too for people more easily. Yeah, fantastic. Do you think that that's a, a sector that's been well enough looked after in our new plans uh, here in Queensland, Leah? Um, probably not particularly. We have had the NDIS as well, and we do have the Platinum range that is usually incorporated, but it does come slightly under a different request, um, similar to the way Queensland deals with the Indigenous housing. It does sit within a different section of the department, and I, it, at the moment it just doesn't feel like you know, we're so under supply and we're just not looking at really innovative ways to do things. We're just, as Sophie said, we've just got to keep, you know, you're proceeding along this existing path because that's a well-trodden path, but it hasn't been providing what we've needed. And now we're sort of in crisis response, but, you know, we are meeting, we are having senior executive sort of housing committee groups, but I'm still not seeing ideas tabled about, you know, unutilised land. And I think Sophie's, um, the launch housing project is brilliant. Unutilised land from different departments with lease agreements over them that could turn over. We're looking at modular, um, but mostly that's been a response again, technology changes, but to supply and labour issues at the moment that we're finding um, in South East Queensland and more severely remotely. Um, so we've got a big diverse state. Um, it's really, everything's very dispersed. So it takes a long time to get things out to where we need them. Um, and we've got to look at smarter ways of doing that. But yeah, I think there's also policy changes and planning is just, you know, such a beast, yet it's such, you know, really red tape and quite made up. But, you know, policy shifts and what boarding houses are, what rooming accommodation is, what community housing could be. I, why can we not have second dwellings that are pre-approved sitting in people's backyards you know, or Michael Lavery's excellent sort of adaptive reuse of a garage if you can work with local government to provide on-street parking. We're just not really looking at those things that are sort of staring us in the face. I don't know why, because it's too hard, probably, <laughs> because it's yeah. you know, four years till the next election every time and that seems to be too 
too short a time to want to have poke the bear and have a go so yeah we, we thank you that's a that's a great and honest response it, it lays out some of the real challenges that we have as a profession to sort of push this forward i want to invite jamie to uh unmute and make your comment jamie do you want to jump in yeah sure um one, give me one second to switch on my camera um, oh you're probably high mate Yes, sorry. I'm Jaime. <laughs> Agree. Sorry, I'm just struggling with this video as well. Hello. Hi, thank you very much. <clears throat> Great conversation. Thank you very much for such a good conversation on, on a lunchtime. I really enjoyed and very important topic. Um, I just wondering, um, I see lots of lessons learned from, you know, understanding the, 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 the local, you know, the local market, the, the, the local needs. And this is absolutely fantastic. I'm just wondering if there is a lot of lessons learned. Um, I'm from Europe, I'm from Spain, uh, of different products, different approaches of other cities around the world that we can really start to educate, you know, these communities to see different products that they can, they are very successful, different densities. I don't know if there is much um, that we have done in that regard or is something that we still need to, to push a little bit farther. That was my... I will, that would be my question. Thank you. And it's not a question. It's, it's more like a, a thought. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Jaime. Sophie, you've probably got something to add there. Yes. Um, so I just did on a, went on a study tour for three weeks and there was um, the International Social Housing Festival that was held in Helsinki this year. Um, it's a festival that started only a few years ago. It was the third festival. And um, actually, it's going to be in Barcelona next March, if, if you're <laughs> heading that way. Um, it was quite European-centric because it's been hosted by Amsterdam, Lyon, Helsinki, and now Barcelona. But there were um, a couple of Australians there and people from Hawaii in the States. Um, so that was great to see. Uh, also, it, it talked about the breadth um, of the issue so it there was there was a design focus so I went to a lot of open house um, um, case studies to have a look at but they also talked about policy and, and funding and um, all that and it was inspiring because a lot of those cities have a lot more than us but I also found out that we're not the worst um, Barcelona is really struggling um, with their social housing and and um, they have uh, very little land too so uh, we do have that um, we have land, I guess, going for us. Um, and then I also visited Vienna that um, had the, the end of their international building exhibition, which has been six years and they've been building demonstration projects, all with social housing. They have an incredible history of over a century long of really focusing on social housing and Vienna has 60% social housing. It's a completely different approach to us, like everyone um, from the lowest um, socioeconomic groups up to sort of middle income um, to live in social housing in Vienna and it's certainly not this crisis model we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were interestingly um, focusing to one of their biggest principles was getting the neighbourhood right. So there I did visit some um, projects but most of them were in new neighbourhoods that they'd established around the city. Um, yeah, so there's definitely lessons to be learnt um, from other cities and um, case study projects around the globe for sure. Fantastic. It's um, it's you. inspiring to hear that you're um, going off and speaking with other people who are expert in this area, Sophie. Um, it's, it's really fantastic. Um, we're going to wrap up soon, but before we do, because we, we're going to hand over to Michael at the end to talk about the fundraising that we're doing, which of course this is uh, wrapping into. Um, Leah, I think you, um, Sophie spoke at the beginning about spreading the word and how we can um, advocate for this as a profession. What's your, you know, obviously you've got a lot of passion about this, which is one of the reasons we have you on. How can the rest of the profession support you and support a sort of more um, progressive approach to this? What, what action do you need from architects and academics and the students who are listening to this? 
Um, look, it's a, it's a hard one, but I think um, it's great to talk to your clients about actually, you know, looking at embedding affordable housing into their product. I think having the discussions, if architects are a little bit more geared, the idea that we have to wait for inclusionary zoning, which, you know, we all know that the development industry will kick up a big stink if we do that anyway. So it's sort of this idea of, oh, that they'll do it if they're given an incentive. Well, maybe the consultants can start working together on finding incentives within the project to do that. Like, go and talk to the local governments and say, if we put an extra two units in, but they were part of the NDIS, would that be appropriate? And starting to just come up with a little bit more solutions and take pushing their clients into that, but in a space that they're quite comfortable with. Um, I think that a little bit of ownership, a little bit of saying, this is what we believe in. Um, and we honestly think that should be incorporated into every project. And it's that journey when people realise that, you know, I think we know now post COVID and mortgage stress and where inflation is going now, there's no longer the stigma like everybody could be in this space anyone's auntie or neighbor so that idea needs to sort of start to go away and if it's managed properly we can get affordable components into each development um you know we're, we're doing too much of the luxury stuff we don't want australia to end up in an inequality housing space however the whole you know we know the whole financial system of housing as asset um, and capital gains is, is a huge problem. Um, and while that happens, we will keep having people make, you know, very bad decisions about leaving vacant properties, for instance, because it's a tax benefit mm. for them, which is just a preposterous discussion to think that we have homes sitting there with no one in them and people actually think that's an okay, you know, acceptable use of resources in this country. So local governments are trying to do stuff like that on that of you know higher rates and and taxing mechanisms but it's very difficult um so yeah i, I just think every if everyone can start to step up and and say things like that let's not have houses sitting there with no one in it and if you can put another two units in a development talk to the local government about it and see if they can actually be sold you know at, at a market below market rate and and commit to it and and talk to a housing provider that's fantastic yeah, go ahead. Is that, well, just um, don't, if you're working in a firm and you're passionate about this, you don't have to wait for your directors or associates to make that decision. Go and speak to them, um, you know, whatever your position is um, within your practice. And, um, you know, the guys that work for me all found um, at my practice because they wanted to do something good in this field. So I think any of us can speak up and it can just go up the food chain. Fantastic. Leading from wherever you are, that um, seems to be the message and it's a really great approach. Um, and both of you are doing that, whether you're the state government architect or whether you've formed your own firm to specifically do this. It's very um, inspiring and encouraging to see that. And um, great to see women leading these initiatives too, but um, all the men who are there, you know, there's a role for you as well. So it's great to hear that. And speaking of men, I'm gonna hand over to Michael to wrap us up and talk about the Sleep Out for Homelessness, which is coming up at the end of next week. Oh, I'm still a child, Kelly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, look, uh, I'll just quickly share my screen just to indulge you in, in something. Oops, sorry. Uh, okay, so you can you can see our our grand total. Hopefully, everyone here. So you know the the other you know big thing that we we're trying to do in in our campaign, firstly is is to raise awareness and and you know the really generous um, uh, contribution by Leah and Sophie and also Alana and uh, Fiona last week. We really appreciate that and uh, you know of a round of applause because it's it's not only the time that you see um you know presenting it's the time preparing it's our conversations and everything like that and we, without the sort of support of the wider profession um we, we just couldn't do this the other thing is is that you know everyone around this room is somehow involved in the in the sleep out and you know kelly and i ask everyone to you know why don't you put yourself out put extra time sleep out cold and and hustle for money for us so that we can we can keep um supporting those who who actually do help um in very tangible ways uh, people on that journey back to safer housing and so for everyone else in the room um at the moment and and who are associated with this we also thank you as well 
But I'd like to to update us all on on where we are with the fundraising, and and we're, we're creeping up to that halfway mark. And um, we might sort of think, oh, gee, we're we're not doing very well. But uh, Kelly and I can attest that from from previous uh, years that that we've raised almost two thirds of our final total, sometimes within the last three days of our campaign. So the fact that we're almost halfway at this point is 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 pretty good. But and we do understand people are doing it tough and there's a lot of anxiety out there with cost of living. But, you know, I would like to sort of share and, and thank everyone, um, all the teams who have participated this year from BVN, who who are just kind of knocking it out of the park at the moment. Um, and a lot of practices who consistently year on year um, help us with this mad venture and uh, a few new faces for, for this year as well. So we'd like to sort of thank everyone. And I think if I do this here, we should get a new total or is it already totaled? So 34,775, let's say, um, we're out at the moment, which is a brilliant total at, at this stage. <clears throat> but, you know, it, we, we aren't the Red Cross. <laughs> and we'd like you to, to hustle your, your networks um, hard in this final little bit so that we can uh, get somewhere close to a rather ambitious total this year of 75,000. And it is important because the, the sleep out contributes uh, quite a large proportion of funds going into second chance program. And um, as we've been saying in the propaganda we've been telling you over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, second chance of volunteer run, our overheads are less than 1%. Um, which is unheard of in, in the charity sector. And, and that goes to uh, quite a large number of, of um, shelters across um, the state, as well as programs like uh, rental income support, education, um, and helping people uh, on that journey to safer housing. So anything you can do to sort of hit up your family networks, your friends, those people in your practice or office who haven't you know, contributed, sort of ask them why not <laughs> and uh, get them to, to jump onto the site and, and help us out because it really does mean a lot to um, people who are doing it tough and, and it's, a, it's a very small thing that we can do. So that's all I'd wanted to, to say uh, and to, to thank everyone for their time. But, you know, our job is to get in the cash as well. So let's, let's work on that um, over these next 10 days or so that we've got on the, until the sleep out, which is uh, Friday week, uh, August 5th. So did you want to say anything else, Kelly? Otherwise we can wrap it up and we'll be pretty much finished exactly on time. No, that's it, Michael. I, um, I suppose the only thing I would add is that the vast majority of our donations uh, tend to be $50 or less. So even if you can only chuck in $10 or $15, oh. that's absolutely fine. Um, and the same for your your friends and family. It's 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 a many hands kind of situation. So um, we appreciate every donation, no matter how big or how small. So, mm. and thanks to Leah and Sophie. Fantastic to hear from you both, and and really great to see all the wonderful work you're doing. Mm. Super. Thanks. Pleasure. And well done, everyone. Thank you. Well done. So Thank if you, you Sophie. understand Thank your you. Um, design guideline right up the chain in Queensland government, if that's all right. Yes, please. Awesome. We need one for up here too. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.